one day, and I guess I must have been six-ish, I saw rally cars on TV and it was the most exciting thing I had ever seen in my life. And one particular car stuck in my mind and I thought one day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to drive a car like that. I ended up leaving home at 14 because I couldn't deal with the craziness. It was insane in my house. And I thought I was better getting away from it. I got a sense of satisfaction for um, achieving the little goals when I was a kid and you know I now know that's a trait of mentally tough people practice what I preach I talk about mental toughness pretty much every day of the week and I I practice it every day of the week you know I'm always pushing myself learning stuff experimenting and the passion that I have now is to share what I've learned and what mm. with, with you so you can do it because there's nothing more thrilling than seeing somebody's life turn around if I could have designed my life years ago, um, it would have been this way. <laughs> the way I'm presenting the mental toughness concept, you know, so lots of people talk about high performance, lots of people talk about, you know, mindset and all that. So this this is different. I, I present this in a way that probably people haven't heard it presented in this way. Um, and of course, I don't stand on stage and tell anyone anything. I ask lots of challenging questions in a coaching way, although the mm -hmm. audience wouldn't really notice it was a coaching question. But because I'm asking lots of questions throughout it, you cannot help but answer them in your own mind as you're sat listening. That's quite powerful because you're coming up with solutions and answers in your own head. I don't mind having a go at stuff. I just don't mind. And I don't mind losing stuff. My happiness, my success is, is, is about helping other people because that feels like a gold medal every day. Sales can be quite a lonely job. It can be also quite uh, exposed and it can also be very challenging. The, the person at the top of the pile could have you know, some really good clients and they might not be a particularly good salesperson, so they're an order taker. The person at the bottom of the league might be really talented and hard working, but just doesn't have a good panel or number of clients to work on. The harsh reality is the league table's produced, and, and that's where you are. The successful people are the ones who know when to lose in the first round, because salespeople, again, tend to be optimistic and competitive. So they will want to win. They'll want to get past the first, you know, and that, in many respects, is what serves them well. But maybe sometimes the good ones, or maybe the good managers, tell them when to walk away because they're not going to win it. The ones who are struggling, way I can help them in terms of coaching, is try and work out both what they do from an activity perspective and what their self-talk is, you know, from a mental toughness and resilience and an MTQ perspective. And that really helps. Sometimes I have to be brutal with them and say, leave it, walk away. You're not going to win it. Save your time. Focus on the opportunity to do what you can close. They project the image of self-confidence, but deep down inside they aren't, but do manage to put on a reasonable act when they're in front of customers. It makes perfect sense. I don't think for a moment you can tell if somebody's mentally tough, for example, you know, because like the swan gliding across the water, you don't really know what's going on underneath. Salespeople do burn out because the results are so evident on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. So-and-so's results seem to be slipping. We need to do something about it. And whether that's the manager or an independent coach like me or HR or whoever. I think people in other roles within business might be just as prone to burnout, but their performance is less obvious. I've not heard of many salespeople who've been allowed to completely burn out because the, the nature of the role enables early interventions. But I do think, if anything, over the last however many years, you know, mental toughness and mental health has become high profile. And I do think, therefore, that many first line managers are aware of these issues and will try and stop, you know, to avoid people getting to burn out. Mm. Can someone be a good salesperson if they sell on a product they don't really care about? No. You have to care about it, do you? Yes. Anybody who serves their country and is sent away to support, the government sends them, they're going on behalf of you and me. So that I think that helps the commitment. 
the preparation we've gone through, pre-parachute selection, all the training and what have you, had made us capable of achieving that. What we didn't know is how each of us, both as individuals and as a unit, would perform you know, in the ultimate pressure when we came under fire. And that is difficult to prepare people for. I think it's a true test that when you're frightened, how you react. Sometimes, well, a mentally tough person can be frightened, of course. That's perfectly exactly, okay. Exactly, exactly, exactly. In interestingly, next month, November, I'm running a fundraiser for local veterans, the charity that you told me about, you talked about earlier, uh, with a guy from the SAF, joined the Paris at 17, went into the SAF at 21, shot the leading terrorist at the reigning embassy siege in 1980. And his book is called Fighting Scared. Right. Hmm. I don't think anybody fights not scared. You know, that's hmm. the ultimate test of your confidence. It's channeling those emotions into, you know, the positive behavior, the, the, the things that you've been taught, you've been trained to do almost automatically. People ask, why do you march? Why do you learn things, you know, to do things automatically? Because you don't have an opportunity to have a committee meeting and decide what we're going to do once you come under fire. You've got to be well-trained. You've got to be able to control your emotions. You've got to be able to channel that fear into the self-confidence that you can do the right job and do what's necessary to win. We talked about confidence in salespeople, and in some respect, there are many parallels with you know fighting in a war. I think it's that sense of, engaging with normal emotions and being able to channel them and use them in a positive way that enables exactly. people to do abnormal things. The parallels with a soldier going into battle and somebody walking onto a stage and talking to 300 people, they're similar. I, I won't yeah. say they're the same <laughs> unless, the, unless the 300 people in the audience are armed. If the individual is making that presentation, they will have rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. They'll know exactly what they're going to say so that it becomes natural. You know, they're not thinking about what am I saying next. And a soldier will do exactly the same. They will know exactly what they've got to do, and they'll do it without thinking. We started this conversation <laughs> by talking about salespeople being the athletes in the business world, and we've moved it to the salespeople being the military wing. <laughs> <laughs> Employers want graduates with three main skills, communication, agility, and adaptability. And all of these is part of resilience. So they want graduates that are more resilient when they graduate and they go out there and work. We want it to help our students to be more resilient, to be more flexible, and to be more adaptable. But where to start from? This is the mental agility program. So helping students to be the best version of themselves through the mental toughness framework and the MTQ plus questionnaire to find where the weaknesses lie, if they've got any weaknesses, or where the point of strengths are, and apply these to the workplace once they graduate. We can talk about the benefits, you know, like endlessly, but I feel like the benefit is exactly this, empowering people, empowering young professionals you know into understanding at least in higher education then the application of these concepts goes at all levels you know senior management i know you peter have applied this to senior management and whatever but at least a um, higher educational level helping students to really really understand who they are what they stand for and how they can develop so what's really helping us to keep this project alive and the developing it and running it in the next terms is the impact it's making on our students. One particularly interesting uh, group was um, when I had the opportunity to do it with the um, International Master's Programme for Managers, which is a, a, a very unusual programme because it, it, um, it's, it is, as, it, as the name says, it's international. So it involves students based in um, Montreal, Yokohama, Rio de Janeiro, Bangalore. Uh, so it's a very international, but they're all senior managers and they're all involved in big organisations. This is the opposite end of the scale, really, to the, to the group that um, uh, Alessia has been working on. These, these are managers who've been there, done it all, and now what they're doing is sort of stepping back and thinking about how to go to the next level. So this is what's really interesting about it. It's, it's as relevant and helpful for those people, judging by what they've said about it, 
to as it is to to these younger students and and I think that's really exciting you've been around enough years to have seen a lot of <laughs> cohorts of students do they almost need mental toughness now more than more than they have done in the past I think um all of the cohorts of students over the years that I've worked with um would have benefited from the kind of insights that you can gain from this. The thing that really carried the day was our mental toughness. It helped make me a better decision maker. It helped me stay composed um, in, you know, in, in those difficult situations where there's all like gray areas, maybe there's some moral ethical decisions. And I just realized when I came back that, hey, we, we have to start training our brain the way we train our bodies, our craft and our character. And it just sent me on this, you know, 20 year odyssey in and out of the military that where my mission is now, you know, I want to help leaders and teams get better from the inside out. Once my friend, Dr. Michael Gerson, shout out to him, tipped me off to the 4C model. I was like, this is it. And, um, and that's when I reached out to you. And here we are. I, I started being exposed to this idea of post-traumatic growth. And how can you, and it started asking this question, like, how come so many veterans were coming back and, and they're having post-traumatic stress versus some are having post-traumatic growth? And then how can you, how can you front load mental and emotional training in ways that would make it more likely that you're going to have post-traumatic growth versus stress. It's kind of, you, know, you look at Peter Drucker, you know, one of the godfathers mm-hmm. of modern management, right? You know, and what, it, what is his principle is that what gets measured gets managed, right? And so that we're obsessed with metrics, right? And we get the squishy mental stuff, right? That, you know, and it's okay, how do I measure that? It's really three key things. It's what is the purpose behind what we're doing? What are the three critical tasks we need to accomplish to accomplish the mission? And what are the desired outcomes? I can come in and I can assess leaders, you know, in this, in these specific areas and develop a plan individually and collectively, you know, in terms of where, where have you started from a baseline now based on our interventions and things you've done on your own, have you improved over time? In the corporate world is that leaders speak a language that makes them predisposed to already develop within themselves and teach to others. We as practitioners have to just be okay with the fact that, you know, it's not going to be perfect. When I first took the graduate record exam, you know, um, I, I took a, I paid like, you know, a lot of money for a prep course and I went to the courses, but I, I never cracked a book. So I had all the middle <laughs> skills in the world and I was really confident and I did all this stuff too. I, I didn't get a good score because I wasn't competent. So I was yeah. confident, but I was not competent because I did not have the skills that I could let out. And what I love about it too, it's simple. It's people could say it would be four C's. Okay. All right. Well, that's easy to remember. Well, I think just a lot of people don't spend a lot of time asking, they tell me, okay, what am I going to do? And where am I going to go? And what do I want to accomplish? And they never ask the question, who am I? People are going to do what they need to do. And sometimes that's the best thing for them is to cut their losses and move on. You can be mentally tough and cut your losses. I call that grits, glass, grass ceiling. You know, it's yeah. knowing your limits. For me, one of the things that I love about mental toughness is it stops some of that sheep dip training that you might get. Everybody needs confidence. Well, no, not everybody does. Some people don't need that. They need something completely different. In fact, lots of people need something different. So it allowed them, and I think for the offenders especially, for them to feel that they were being dealt with as an individual when you've been in that institutionalized in that way, you kind of lose your identity, the who you are, the kind of things that make you tick, your values, your beliefs, and and actually they were able to work with them on a one-to-one basis that I think made them feel for the first time valued. They've got somebody that really works with them on an individual level. They flourish and they've gone into work, volunteering or education. But one thing you said earlier, Joe, that I thought was, was really interesting was about the, they were almost surprised to have scored lower because of this fallacy of thinking going through tough times makes you tough. Like, the uh, probably the worst phrase very popular is that idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger right which is nonsense trauma does not make you stronger support makes you stronger what the mental toughness gave them is they gave them ways to work with that person and it gave them a really quick way to build rapport because we had 12 months to work with somebody which feels like a really long time But when you're talking with significant trauma, when you're talking about somebody that has been in prison for a period of time, 12 months is nothing. They haven't even got a home to start with. That's the first thing these guys have to do. So while 12 months might feel like a long time in our world of L&D or OD to support somebody, when they've gone through multiple 
challenges of what is deemed by perhaps societies multiple, you know, they have multiple complex needs. 12 months is not a long time. And we very much focused on solution focused mentoring. So we looked at all the strengths that a person brought rather than the problems to really support somebody to get them to feel settled. If we look at that kind of that fundamentals, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these guys don't have any of that to start with. So that one-to-one -one support was really crucial. And that's how we got, I guess, everything to work and everything to click together, if that answers the question, John. Yeah, yeah, it does. Got fantastic results. We measured the social return on investment of the project. Um, as I mentioned, we're able to evidence a social return on investment of this project to so around £45,000 per person on programme. I guess if we're looking at it from a data level, what we know is that from an MTQ basis, participants significantly have increased their mental toughness scores throughout the program by measuring the mental toughness intermittently. What we were able to do is also show the participant their growth, because sometimes you don't realize how far you've come. It gives them something to see Well, you were here and you are now here. That's huge. And the reports then tell them that it's different. The wording in the reports is different. So it, it really does um, enhance their growth, I think, and, and that's really useful. Individual personal things that for me, they may seem, like I say, small, but seeing somebody that didn't make eye contact, somebody that, you know, when you first met them, couldn't be in a room with other people, suddenly they're speaking in front of, 80 people at one of their conferences telling them how the project's impacted them and, and the difference it makes. That stuff's really brilliant. Especially if it's a funded project, we're having to be more creative with how we can evidence impact. Um, if it's not written down, it didn't happen, is my favorite saying to my, to my clients. So what the mental toughness gives is it gives them something that they can tangibly touch we're able to evidence a social return on investment of this project to so around £45,000 per person on programme. As I've been using it more and more, I use it now in so many different ways now because I've just learned to be more curious with it. And that's kind of how I, I guess that's, that's how I apply it. As we know, sales can be a stressful uh, environment, which is driven by, you know, an end of month, end of quarter goals, and also requires you to be resilient to keep going for the sales opportunity. So I was asked to develop a program that would build um, tenacity uh, in sales, but also to create a very positive sales approach, which is selling to people's needs and wants, um, but also to, to maximize all the business opportunities that we have available to us. Uh, the Cornerstone program has helped to target people at all stages of their career to provide them with the skills and the behaviors and the knowledge and understanding. Um, of the mental toughness concept and also uh, the, the sales focused modules that help to drive business success. But the most interesting module for, for many of our participants has actually been the emotional intelligence and resilience module. Uh, obviously, in a sales environment, you're going to be driven by goals and every day you've got to work toward achieving those goals. So that covers your goal orientation and your achievement orientation. We know that if you're in a sales environment, that there is a degree of risk. You may need to create a forecast. You may need to have some prediction of, of what the market is going to do, what your customers are going to do, which is your risk orientation. Moving into learning orientation, you've got to continually learn from everything that you do. If you get a no, why did you get a no? How could you turn that no into a yes at a future point? And of course, if you're a salesperson, you're dealing with people. So you've got to have um, a good degree of interpersonal confidence to, to, to meet with these people who may have more experience, more knowledge, um, maybe a, a different life stage to you, different interests. So you've got to be able to find that common ground by establishing conversations. And of course, a salesperson is also going to require to be confident in their own abilities to sell the product or service that they have. And coming really around to the last element of control, clearly, you, you have to believe that you can make a sale happen. Of course, you don't need the unrealistic belief that you can make every sale happen. But the, the life control that, you know, I can decide to go and see this person, I can approach this in a different way, I can flex my style. Uh, and if I don't succeed, I'll learn from it. And finally, emotional control, you know, sales involves a whole 
cornucopia of emotions, both from a buyer's perspective and a seller's perspective. From the seller's perspective, you've got end of month pressure, expectation on you to perform. And from the seller, depending on what the market, but the buyer, depending on what the, the, the product or the market is, that there may be stress, there could be anxiety, there could be excitement, there could be desire. So clearly in a sales environment, mental toughness is a great fit. Every time I speak to you, Jason, um, you kind of leave me breathless. Four years ago, you came across the concept and you must have entered this program with a level of knowledge and understanding of the concept of the eight factors. It seems to me that you, your knowledge and understanding of it has really grown considerably through this sort of practice and application. I, I suppose I'm a serial, a serial offender when it comes to learning. Um, and I've seen them flourish and benefit. Some of the conversations I've had whilst qualifying to become the licensed user for an MTQ with, with friends that I've known for a short period of time and others that I've known for longer was, was some of the richest and deepest conversations I, I think I've ever had. Uh, I was absolutely mind blown by the depth that we were able to go in. And of course, I'm grateful to them for allowing me to have those conversations with them. I've been interested with the impact on mental health, which is a topic which has been close to my own heart for some time. Um, one in four of us will, will suffer uh, poor mental health in our time and the effects can be truly devastating. And for me, the, the, the interesting thing was that those in their 20s and 30s are most likely to suffer mental health problems as a result of a lack of confidence. And of course, we know that that's one of the key elements of the mental toughness program. I'm a great believer, John, that um, key to success is having as many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to life in your hand as mm. possible. And I think the more that you can understand yourself, the more pieces of the jigsaw puzzle you, you've got. When I'm good at something, I'm naturally passionate about it. And I like it because I like feeling that way. You could be good at whatever you do. So just find something you like. And it mm. sort of sounds very simplistic. But when we apply that and look through the lens of the, the mental toughness model as well, so much of those four elements of the, the mental toughness model do bring us to that point of we really are operating at our highest performance level and our highest well-being level when we bring all those four things together, doing something that really inspires us agility and a flexibility the certain the directive the 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 leader that people want to follow but we've also got to be able to embrace the the people who are not as wired up for high performance and this comes back to our well-being and I find more and more that the foundation of the coaching work I do with 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 leaders and earlier career um, people as well is their health and their well-being they need those rituals in place they need that self-care before it, it really is putting the oxygen mask on and keeping it on while you serve or while you deliver or while you facilitate other people's growth and development as well. I conducted a number of interviews with women in STEM a couple of years ago at different stages of their leadership and particularly women who had taken a technology uh, a degree and uh, direction in their career. And I have to say that they, their overarching mindset was similar that they were pursuing their vision, their goals, what they wanted to achieve, the, the difference they wanted to make. First of all, we've got to develop our own voice and the message we want to take to the world that reflects what's important to us as individuals. The mental toughness profile, the, the, it helps me just to take, pause, take breath and allow space for, for them to express themselves in their way and not be wrong for doing it their way mm. because it's different to my way. If you have to shout in the meeting to get your point heard, 
you are allowed to shout if that's what it takes. It's fascinating to see how different and yet how similar we are at our core. Mm. When you when you strip away all of the stuff on the outside. I think that's a really good point, Leah, because we've noticed it in our work quite a lot that we know the evidence is that males and females are broadly the same. So mm-hmm. um, if from an internal perspective, there's no reason why a woman can't do what a man can do. But it's the external environment. 